Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for this webinar tonight. Um, my name is Julia McLeod. I'm the Outreach Director for the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust. This is one of a series of webinars, um, our Stories of Change series throughout this year. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the next two webinars coming up. In September, we have From Global to Local, Connecting the Global Climate Justice Movement to Maine, um, with an inspiring young speaker on your right. Um, in October, we have rockweed, rockweed Research from the Bottom Up with Hannah Weber. Um, so I hope you can join us for a couple of those. We'll have, again, another one in November and December. We'll announce those soon. So uh, just about the webinar tonight, um, it being a webinar, we can't see or hear you, but you can interact with us by typing your questions in the chat. So at the bottom of your screen, you can find the chat and you can type questions in the chat anytime during the webinar. Um, I'm not going to ask Trevor to answer them during his talk, but at the end, there's going to be time for questions and I'll ask those questions at the end. So we will get to them. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm really excited to hear Trevor talk. And without further ado, I will pass it over to you. Great. Um, so let me click on the, wait, wait, let's see. Too many windows open. Oh, there we go. Share mm -hmm. screen. There. Excellent. Is it showing up for you? Okay, great. Well, thank you to Julia and for the Harpsville Heritage Land Trust for uh, the invitation to talk about bats. Um, this is something that I've been focused on with my career since about 2007. And um, it was really something I had not envisioned before that time. Um, but the beginning in about 2004, 2005, the, the, it was discovered that bats are susceptible to collision with, with wind turbines. And in my wor work as a um, biologist with a consulting company, we quickly found ourselves um, being asked by wind developers if we could help them figure out ways of, of understanding more about why bats are susceptible to collision and if we can uh, use information to, to perhaps find areas without bats or uh, somehow minimize the potential risk that that wind projects pose to bats. And along the way, I've, I've been able to work on a, a pretty interesting variety of projects and be able to aggregate information from wind farms across much of the, much of, of the United States. And um, I've also had the opportunity to take some of that data and, and go back to graduate school. And um, a year ago, I just earned a PhD from the University of Maine, looking back at some of this aggregated data from, from multiple wind farms. And so, it, it's been a very interesting opportunity to be able to do some, some really innovative and interesting research while working as a, um, as a consultant. So I'm based, my company is Stantech Consulting and, and we're a Canadian company, kind of people all over the place, but our office here is here in Topsom, Maine. And it's been a wonderful place to, uh, to, to base my operations here as I've, I've, I've learned more about bats along the way. So, I appreciate, first of all, your interest in bats too. They're often something that's considered either a pest or something somewhat undesirable, scary. You know, it, they're, they don't occupy, or they historically have not occupied a very um, esteemed position in the, in the realm of animals and wildlife. But I think that's starting to change as people learn more about them. And hopefully I'll be able to give you a little bit of an introduction and background, partly of, of why bats are so interesting. So my goal is to cover kind of a wide range of, of topics on bats and the work that I do specifically with bats and wind energy and cover a lot of bases and then hopefully leave room for questions um, without going into tremendous detail in any of the areas. I'll, I'll try to cover a lot and then, then allow time to, to circle back and, and go into greater detail um, if people have, have questions. Um, so first of all, you know, as far as bat anatomy is concerned, you know, bats are mammals. They're the only mammal that's capable of powered flight. And their wings are really not too different. It's a modified forearm, essentially. So if you hold your own arms out, I don't know if I, my whole arm can get in here. If you stick your arms out and stick your thumbs up, your thumbs are basically the little claw that's on the front of the wing. And your four remaining fingers form, in the case of a bat, form the structure of the wing. So they have much elongated um, finger bones, but it's essentially the same structure as most other mammals have. In the case of bats, there, there's a 
the same gene that controls foot development in mice is actually responsible for um, wing development in bats, but there's one particular part that's suppressed that allows the membrane to form between uh, the finger bones, and that creates the wing. So unlike birds, which have non-living tissue making feathers, um, the entire wing membrane of a bat is living tissue with, with blood vessels. And you can see the in this, this x-ray, you can see that it's all vascular tissue um, that's, that's very thin, but highly mobile. So a bat can actually manipulate the shape of its wing into a, an extremely um, dynamic airfoil, essentially, is, is what a bat really looks like. Um, there's some confusion often that for why bats are such good flyers. It's sort of assumed perhaps that they're not as good at flying as birds are, but they're, they're extraordinarily capable in the air and capable of some, some pretty amazing um, aerial maneuvers, which I'll show you a little sample of later. In terms of diversity, bats are, are the second most diverse group of mammals on the planet, second only to rodents. There's an estimated about 1,240 species worldwide. And in many areas, there are more species of bats than any other kind of small mammal. Um, so with these species, they range in size from the, the tiniest bumblebee bat shown here on the left, and that's an adult. They weigh you know, less than two grams, all the way up to a multiple kilogram um, flying fox. So these, you know, these bats are very distinct in terms of their, their niche and their, their shape, their morphology and behavior, but they're all bats. And so across the globe, Bats occupy an astonishing range of ecological niches. Um, many bats consume insects, but not all. There are fruit eating bats like this, this uh, flying fox. Um, other bats are important pollinators. There are bats in the American Southwestern deserts that, that actually run around on their folded up wings and eat scorpions. So pretty much wherever you can find warmish weather, you have bats exhibiting, you know, filling in a lot of different niches. And many of these niches are quite specialized. And for that reason, a lot of bats right now are, are facing a number of, of conservation concerns, whether it be habitat loss or various diseases. Um, but in many cases, habitat loss is what has historically um, limited a lot of bat and threatened a lot of bat populations. In the United States, there's 47 bat species. Um, there's a little bit less of a range, they, but for still three to 70 grams is, is pretty distinct. These are clearly not the scale, but the wet Western pipistrelle is the smallest in the, in the United States on the left. And the um, greater, greater mastiff bat on the right is one that is almost two feet in wingspan. So again, a pretty huge range in size and equally variable um, type of ecological niches that these bats occupy. Bats are also really important from a practical sense. They eat, and in, in North America, they eat an astonishing amount of insects, many of which would otherwise be agricultural pests. There was a recent paper in Science Magazine that estimated that bats in the US alone provide $3.7 billion worth of pest control. So there's a lot of interest in, in obviously, from a practical standpoint of maintaining bat populations not only for their practical purpose, but also for their, their amazing ecological diversity. So in Maine, we have eight bat species, all of which are known as micro bats, and they're all insect eating nocturnal bats. So they, they share a relatively similar life history in that they eat insects and they look vaguely the same. They, these are all um, simply an outline to show relative scale. Um, but within this range, there's still quite a, quite a bit of variety in terms of life history. So five of the bats in Maine, the, the four on the left here, and the big brown bat hibernate. And so in the wintertime, they find some sort of relatively warmer um, location, whether it be a cave, in some cases a mine. In some cases, in the case of big brown bats, it might be your attic or a basement. Um, and they spend the winter in in a pretty deep state of hibernation, really awaking only a couple times a winter. Um, the other three, the hoary bat, eastern red bat, and silver-haired bat are migratory. And so much like songbirds, they, they actually fly south in the winter and remain somewhat active all year. And there's really not very much known about what they do in winter, how far they go, and what their behavior is like. But 
it's important to know that you know not all bats are the same and there's a pretty wide range of where they might be at any given time. But in the summertime, so from April until about November, all of these species roost in trees um, and, and old buildings and so forth, but they don't return to caves all summer. So they can be found in pretty much any forest, but they like big dead trees with loose bark that they can kind of crawl up underneath. So in summertime, they like to stay warm. Um, they, they give birth to pups in the spring and early summer. So from about April, you know, late April to early June is when they would potentially have pups in these, what they form maternity roosts where a lot of females and pups will congregate together. Um, compared to birds, bats reproduce much more slowly. So they have maybe one or maybe two pups per year compared to for a lot of songbirds, which have you know, clutches of, of you know, several, you know, half a dozen eggs perhaps. And bats live a lot longer. So they're kind of an oddball in terms of small mammals. If you think of another small mammal that eats insects like a shrew, they have what's known as a you know, fast, uh, small fast life history. So they, everything they do is kind of accelerated. They'll often have you know, reach maturity at you know, less than a year old and have, have um, offspring quickly and then die quickly. And bats are a little different. They'll take, um, they can live up to, I've, I believe 32 years is the record for a, a little brown bat. So it's unusual for a small mammal to live that long. And I, I don't know that there's consensus of how they're able to do that, but certainly hibernation and being able to suppress, to turn their body off essentially during the day and enter torpor is presumably part of the, the picture. So every day, essentially, bats be, they, they become much less active during the daytime um, and conserve a lot of uh, their own resources in that way. Whereas once the sun goes down, about a half hour to an hour after sunset, bats begin to be pretty active and, and often will eat insects really throughout the night, foraging in a wide range of insects. But you know, here in Maine, we'd like to think that they're eating all of the black flies and mosquitoes. But in reality, bats eat a lot more moths and beetles and some of these other, you know, slightly more proteiny insects than, than mosquitoes. So if you've seen a bat flying around this summer, which I hope some of you have, the chances are it's probably a big brown bat. These days, that's the most common bat in Maine. 15 years ago, it probably would have been the little brown or the northern long-eared bat that were most common. But a novel disease known as white nose syndrome showed up in Maine in about 2011. And it was first discovered near Albany, New York in 2009. And white nose syndrome has, has decimated populations of the cave hibernating species. So um, these three uh, tricolored bat, northern long-eared bat, and little brown bat, which were all formerly quite common, it's estimated that 90% of those populations um, are gone due to white nose syndrome. So this is an astonishing shift in bat population, the uh, relative abundance of bats. And these bats, which formerly were ubiquitous in Maine, are now nearly, nearly absent. And so you don't see these species around nearly as much. We still detect them in acoustic surveys where we leave a bat detector out for long periods of time, but they're not nearly as common as they once were. Meanwhile, big brown bats have, have seem to weather white nose pretty well um, and are perhaps even more common than they once were. Uh, it's certainly more common in a relative um, case compared to other species. And meanwhile, the hoary bat, eastern red bat, and silver-haired bat, we really don't know much about their population sizes or trends. But you really don't see these species very often unless you're specifically trying to catch them. They're migratory and, and actually in the next week or so, probably large numbers of these are flying through, you know, <laughs> Harpswell and, and the main coast on a nightly basis. It's just, it's very difficult to see them. And even to detect them with acoustics can be tough this time of year. So just quickly, uh, you know, again, a bat is basically like a big flying wing. And some of the ways, the features of bats that we use to identify them are their hair color, the length of their ears, um, whether there's what the color of their fur, so uh, sometimes it's relatively obvious. This is a, a red bat here on the right, which is one that we'll talk quite a bit about in terms of, of their presence offshore in Maine. 
So all bats in Maine use echolocation to not only avoid obstacles, but to capture their tiny insect prey. And then they can do this in complete darkness. And echolocation is a fascinating and, and highly evolved trait that has been around in bats for at least 50 to 60 million years. And so this it evolved quite early. And I think it's, it has evolved multiple times within the bat lineage. Um, and it's really the key in many ways to understanding bat biology. They're nocturnal and small and fly. And so generally speaking, bats are pretty hard to study. Um, and I attended a conference um, devoted entirely to echolocation a couple of years ago, and was really fascinating to learn that you know, scientists are only scratching the surface of the complex ways that bats use echolocation. Um, one particular study showed that if, if one bat is flying, coming in to, to capture a moth or an insect, another bat can actually follow behind silently and eavesdrop and listen to the, the reflections from the first bat and at the last minute swoop in and, and capture the, you know, snatch the prey away from, from the neighbor. Um, and so, you know, echolocation gives bats this sort of secret sense superpower in terms of capturing insects, but a lot of insects have actually developed their own countermeasures and their own tricks. Um, moths in particular, many moths can sense the echolocation pulses and either jam, you know, emit their own sort of jamming frequency that, that to interrupt the, the sonar of the bat, so to speak, or they can actually send out a message saying, you know, hey, I'm toxic, don't eat me, um, is a cue to the bat, you know, that, that they're protected, the bat won't like them. And so there's, these, there's kind of an evolutionary arms race between bats and moths, um, to the extent that some moths even, even fake it and might send the signal saying, oh, I'm toxic, in which when they're actually just bluffing. So there's a lot going on that we simply cannot hear, cannot be aware of without specialized tools to, to um, make that world of ultrasound audible. And, and I like to show this video just again to reinforce that the bats are amazingly acrobatic in the air. So what you see here is, I'll, I'll play it in a minute, there's a moth attached to a piece of fishing line. So it's tethered there and a, a red bat will come in and capture this moth, but it doesn't just grab it. It actually flies in, uses its tail to sort of scoop the moth up and bounce it into its mouth and then eat it all while doing a somersault. So you'll see that here. Oops. So it's pretty amazing footage. And if you can hear the sound that's, uh, that's generated by a bat detector. So those are the sounds the bat is making translated down to human hearing. So again, sort of amazing aerial acrobatics that these bats can do. And again, echolocation is, is our key into this world. With, without it, you know, it's silent. And so for many years, it was, it, was, it was a mystery of how bats were able to fly. And, and I, I wanted to delve into the history of it a little bit because it's a fascinating example of some of the, the interesting things about the scientific method and, and examples both of how, how it can work very well and, and some of the pitfalls of, of uh, scientific discovery. So Donald Griffin essentially discovered echolocation in bats while an undergraduate at Harvard in 1938. And when he was a student, when he was first learning about bats, the common knowledge, the, the assumption was that bats were using some kind of sense of touch to navigate, sort of like how humans with visual impairment can use braille and have kind of heightened sensitivity. Um, this was the thinking and, and the thinking was really despite a lot of interesting work done hundreds of years before. And so while a student, uh, Griffin uncovered the writings of, a, of an abbey from Italy named Lazzaro Spallazzani, who in 17, the late 1790s um, made the discovery in his home, well, I don't know if it's his home office, but he, was, he shared his room with an owl in any, in, in any event, and his candle blew out. And he noticed that the owl couldn't fly successfully in complete darkness and crashed into the wall. You know, it couldn't get it around. Um, whereas the same thing happened to him with a bat, and he realized that the bat was, was unaffected and could, could completely fly normally. And so he was very curious about this, and he, he was a consummate naturalist and, and experimenter. And he designed a series of careful experiments where he documented that bats whose vision was impaired could navigate without issue. Whereas if you, if you plug their ears with wax, 
and sealed them off. They really couldn't navigate at all, even in daylight. And so he concluded that hearing must have played a role, but he just couldn't understand how this could possibly be. And, and so the conventional wisdom of the day was that the, you know, some kind of sense of touch had to do it. But he even tested this by actually coating bats in varnish and found that they were still able to fly just fine. So he had this interesting empirical data that was saying the hearing was involved. But at the time, nobody could thought that that was remotely possible. And so conventional wisdom ruled the day. And um, in, in particular, a more influent, a very influential uh, thinker and scientist named George Cuvier basically concluded it's got to be touch. It has to be, you know, the organs of touch seem sufficient to explain all the, the obstacle avoiding phenomenon which bats exhibit. So he didn't conduct any experiments, but simply his influence was, was so great that everybody had just assumed, okay, it's, it's got to be this. And it wasn't until Donald Griffin uncovered some of the original writings of Spallanzani that he decided to repeat some of those experiments and discovered with the aid of a, of a physics professor that had a device that could hear ultrasound, that bats in fact were making a huge amount of sound. It was just above the range of human hearing. So for the rest of his career, Donald Griffin really pioneered an immense amount of research into echolocation. And if, if you're interested, the, the, the book that he wrote in the 50s called Listening in the Dark is fascinating. It's, it's no longer in print, but you can find copies in, um, in libraries. So it's worth a read for anybody who wants to take a deep dive into echolocation. So more recently, I've mentioned white nose syndrome. And, and if you've heard of bats in the news lately, it's largely either something to do with white nose syndrome or something to do with, with turbine related mortality at wind farms. And this is really what, what I've spent the focus of, of, my, of the last 10 years looking at. Um, as I mentioned before, there's, there's been widespread documentation of bats, primarily long distance migratory bats. And again, the, the hoary bat, the silver haired bat and the Eastern red bat which do occur in Maine, account for roughly 75% of all carcasses found at, at wind farms. And it's not just incidental discoveries. So most wind farms that are built and operated in the U.S. turbines. I, I just looked at a paper where an, over 450,000 of these searches have been conducted, um, or probably more than that, but there's a database that contains the results of you know, nearly a half million of these searches. So there's an immense amount of information on fatality patterns. And there's concern at this point that cumulative mortality from the wind industry alone could imperil the population, the viability of hoary bats in particular. This one species accounts for about 40% of all carcasses found you know, across North America. And generally speaking, fatalities tend to occur you know, during the fall migration period and during nights with relatively low wind speed. So, um, again, two species really are, are kind of the, the stars of this show or the reason for a lot of the research. The Indiana bat is a federally endangered species. It doesn't occur in Maine, but a similar relative, the northern long-eared bat is also federally listed and does occur. So these are protected by the Endangered Species Act. They don't, they're not often killed at wind projects, but it, it happens enough where this has led, you know, it, this is where the regulations come into play that, that require a wind company to take action to reduce or avoid fatality to bats. And then the hoary bat is the species that's really most prone to collision. They're not currently listed federally, and, and in some cases they're protected on a state level. So the regulations really ultimately protect the hoary bat more than other species, but they're designed usually because of the Indiana bat. So, you know, if I've been talking all about how amazing echolocation is and how a maneuverable bat's flight is, you know, why are they colliding with these gigantic reflective structures? And this has puzzled people for a little while. But the general consensus at this point is that bats may actually be attracted to turbines. You know, they see them, they can detect them, and it's sort of this novel feature on the landscape. But bats are not able to detect the, the fast moving blades of these turbines. So even though they don't necessarily rotate that quickly, the, the blades move, move fast and faster than a bat can avoid. So similar to how uh, fast moving vehicles or other um, 
objects can hit bats, this is what's going on with turbines. But what it also means is that bats are only at risk when the turbine is operating. So if you take the tur if you turn the turbine off by feathering the turbine blades, um, bats are no longer at risk. So they don't simply fly into a into a non-moving turbine. So you know there's a solution to avoiding bat fatality, which is to turn the turbine off. But the problem there is obviously that the turbine cannot generate any power when it's off. And so this has set up kind of a, a, a challenge is how I like to think of it, a situation where there's a solution, but it's, it comes at enormous cost to the wind company. And it's sort of counter to the purpose of, of building a wind farm. And so our research is really to try to figure out when are bets actually at risk? So this process of shutting turbines down when it's relatively low wind speed is, is known as curtailment. And most wind farms now, especially in the Northeast that are being built, are required to implement a curtailment plan to, in other words, to prevent operation below a threshold wind speed, somewhere between five to 6.9 meters per second usually. And you know these plans are quite effective at reducing fatalities, but they remain pretty unpopular with wind projects specifically because it, the, the costs are unpredictable. And again, it, it, it cuts into a relatively thin profitability of some of these projects. And it, it's, again, it's sort of counter to the purpose of a wind farm. So the reason it's unpopular is ultimately it's, it's a function of the power in wind. So as wind speeds go from, I've, I've, you know, short range here from about three meters per second is where a turbine can first start moving um, up to about 6.9, which is really where, where the potential power in wind starts to ramp up quickly. So if you curtail below those cut in speeds, you know, this is, these are based on data from um, two wind farms collected over several years, you lose about 150 megawatt hours per turbine per year. So to put that in perspective, if you have a, let's say a 10 turbine wind farm, that's 1.5 gigawatt hours of power over a year, which is about how much a, you know four acres of solar panels could produce. So you, you start to get a sense for the amount of energy involved with some of these um, curtailment programs. And while this is still a relatively small proportion of power compared to what a, what a wind farm could produce over the course of a year, it does add up. And the, the other thing that's happening is, you know, there's a lot of time when the wind speed is below 6.9 meters per second where there aren't bats. And so there's a tremendous interest at this point to figure out a little bit more about what's going on here. And can we better make, or can we make curtailment more strategic to focus only on times when bats are active? And so this is you know, a simplified formula for risk that you have to have a bat and you have to have a turbine spinning and wind speed affects how often, how likely it is that bats are there. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that, that also affects um, this relationship. And the challenge is understanding which of these matter and whether we can incorporate some of these other variables into curtailment programs to limit the amount of energy loss. So the way we've been doing this is to put um, bat detectors on turbines. You can see a little uh, yellow circle up here um, and that detector can record bats flying near the back of the turbine. And what we know then is when a bat is present and we know what the wind speed is like, and we can tell what the turbine is doing and figure out over the course of, you know, accumulating these data over the course of a year, you know, what times of year, what times of night, and what weather conditions are associated with higher risk to bats. Um, and we put all these data into, into pictures that basically show, show risk, show bad activity as a, as a visual depiction of risk. So in this case, you know, this is a picture showing wind speed on the horizontal axis and temperature on the y-axis and the vertical axis. And you can see there's a concentration that most bats are flying around when it's not very windy and when it's very warm. And so when you put these variables together, you can kind of figure out whether the bats are exposed to risk or not. In a normally operating turbine, you know, above about two and a half meters per second, you know, there's, there's the potential for, for um, injury to bats. So all these bat passes in red would be exposed to risk. And that's about 85% of them in this case. 
Whereas if you increase the cut in speed, your exposure drops substantially and all of this bad activity is now protected. So the nice thing with acoustic data is you can really quantify this and measure it in terms of exposed bad activity. And so what we've found through this research um, is that exposed bad activity is a, a quantitative, a statistically significant predictor of fatality. Whereas the stuff that's happening when the turbines are off, this unexposed bad activity really doesn't tell you anything about risk. And so this is kind of the key to understanding when risk occurs, but also understanding how best to, um, to minimize risk or avoid it. And so when you, when you compare these things, I, I, I don't wanna to have too many graphs in here, but this is an important one where you put power loss on the horizontal and the amount of bad activity avoided by curtailing at different wind speeds. So as you go from here, whoops, I'm pointing. So you go from here up, you see there's kind of a diminishing return as the cut in speed goes from three up to about five, six, 6.5 and 6.9. So at some point, you know, once you've crossed about five meters per second in this case, you've avoided about 75% of, of bad activity that would otherwise be exposed to turbine, opera, to turbine operation. But above that, you know, the, there's not as much bad activity remaining and it gets a lot more expensive to avoid in terms of energy loss. So there's a trade-off between the amount of curtailment and the amount of energy you lose and the amount of bats that are protected. So what we do with this information is try to figure out a way to design a, a curtailment plan that's just as good as you know, a given strategy here that's using only wind speed. And the way we do that is by adding other parameters like temperature and also by adjusting the cut in speed of curtailment at different months to better match the seasonal variation in bad activity. And generally speaking, we're able to, to reduce energy loss through sort of a more strategic or smarter curtailment program by anywhere from you know, 25 to 50%. So again, a, a scaled up to an entire wind farm that really can make a big difference in terms of the, the amount of energy. Because ultimately it doesn't do the bats any good to curtail a turbine when there aren't bats active. And so that's really the key of, of this um, approach to curtailment. And I think a good analogy for it is, is speed limits for, for as a tool to reduce um, vehicle collisions. We know that driving slower is safer, but we also know that you don't need to drive slowly on all roads. And there's factors like how many pedestrians and how much visibility is there and how much ice is there on the road that also affect risk. And acoustic data for turbines allow us to find out what some of those other variables are so that we can have uh, limits that are more reactive to the actual conditions um, and the risk factors that are present. So uh, I wanted to, to not talk only about wind and shift gears a little bit, um, something also a little bit closer to home to Harpswell. And, and this is one of the only other tools available to study bats is to actually catch them in a net. And you know they're pretty good at avoiding obstacles, but if you trick them into falling into a mist net, the same nets used to capture birds, you can actually handle the bats and um, put little tiny radio transmitters on them. So in this case, there's a what's called a nanotag that's about a quarter gram radio transmitter that can actually be glued to the back of a bat and tell us where that bat is going. So this was some work we did at the at Bowdoin College's Coastal Studies Center in, in Harpswell back in 2015, where we captured a red bat. Um, I believe it was only one bat we captured here and put a tag on it and released it. And for the next about a month, we were able to document when it, whenever it came in proximity to a, a telemetry station, one of which was at the Coastal Studies Center. And this particular bat, was a juvenile male, you know, born that spring. And it moved, you know, 136 kilometers in just a couple of nights. It flew down the coast to New Hampshire, turned around and went back to Harpswell, and then remained, you know, near the Coastal Studies Center for the next couple of weeks until its, its transmitter failed. And, you know, at the time, this was really one of the first examples of being able to track a migratory bat along the coast um, over the course of, of several weeks. And it didn't, th this individual bat didn't necessarily tell us, you know, the complete story, obviously, 
but it indicated that bats are moving extensively, not just in one direction, but kind of up and down the coast. And this is actually quite similar to what some of the bird data from the same uh, technology is, is showing us that, you know, migratory bats and birds are, are making a lot of movements and um, they can cover a lot of ground in, in quick amounts of time. And so the reason we were doing this work was, was ultimately related to wind energy as well, to, to assess the potential that bats could also be at risk for offshore wind. So we tracked overall, um, several other researchers and us have tracked about 45 bats and have documented up to 800 kilometer and, and more movements along the coast. And this is a very different kind of information than acoustic data, which, which gives you a lot of seasonal coverage, but it doesn't tell you what an individual bat is doing. So this tells you what well, just one single bat does, which may or may not represent a broader population. But when you can combine the two is when it gets very interesting. And um, at this point, you know, this, this map is actually a current plot of every yellow dot here represents a passive telemetry station, all of which are monitoring the same telemetry signal. And I wish the map had looked like this back in 2015, but there were really no yellow dots south of New Hampshire at the time. Um, and so if we were to repeat this experiment now, it might be more likely that we could record bats going down into Delaware and, and so forth. But this monitoring network is known as the MODIS network. It's, it's a fascinating opportunity to study the movements of small creatures like, like bats and songbirds and also even some insects. So this is a very exciting um, opportunity to study migration for, for creatures like bats. And there's a website here that has a lot more information. So as I mentioned, when you can combine acoustics and telemetry, you can learn even more. And, um, in between 2009 and 2012, we also put bat detectors out on a series of lighthouses, and in this case, buoys off the coast of Maine. And what we were interested here in, again, is could we figure out what the conditions were like when bats were offshore? Um, initially, nobody really knew if there would be any bats offshore, but it quickly became apparent where everywhere we put a bat detector, we would detect bats, even as far as you know, 30 kilometers off, off at the Mount Desert Rock. Um, in down East Maine. So in this case, these are admittedly a little confusing dots, but uh, plots, but the, the black dots represent hours in which there was a lot of bad activity and blue is nighttime and yellow is daytime. So it's really pretty much exclusively happening at night. And um, there was a lot of similar patterns in terms of when bats were detected at these two different buoys, which were again, about hundred kilometers apart. So this suggests that there's kind of a widespread movement of bats through the region and um, along the coast during fall. It's not necessarily surprising. It's the same strategy that birds are using to, um, to head south in the fall um, following the coasts. But what was more interesting is when we then overlaid the wind speeds on the same data. And so now the, the colors here represent how windy it was during these hours with warm, like oranges and reds are high wind and blue and, and light green are not very windy. And you can see pretty clearly that you know, the, the hours in which there was a lot of bat activity had very little wind. Um, so again, there's, there's, I think, some consistencies in terms of the types of potential risks that an offshore wind farm could pose to bats versus one um, built on land, even though bats obviously spend most of their time over land. I think the same many of the same lessons will apply from terrestrial wind farms, um, whereas the, the magnitude of risk to bats offshore might be, might be substantially lower. There's fewer, there's less diversity of bats offshore. It's clear that bats are still part of this, this uh, landscape or uh, part of the situation, part of the picture for offshore projects. And these are just some other anecdotal observations from the only offshore wind farm in the North America at this point, um, but that's changing rapidly is the Block Island wind farm. And this was a picture in August of 2016 when they were constructing the wind farm. Um, we, had, we had put bat detectors out on this, this uh, structure, this boat that was building the turbines. And one of the, uh, the crew on the boat sent us a picture of a bat actually roosting in the, in the ship during this period. But again, we're, you know, unsurprisingly perhaps, we saw the same movement of bats through in the fall during migration. Um, 
Similarly, you can put the uh, bat detectors on the turbines themselves. And again, we're, you know, we're seeing bats somewhat predictably during the fall migratory period, and usually during um, nights where it's not particularly windy. So there's admittedly a lot we don't know about bats and, and wind in particular, but especially an offshore wind. But we think that you know, as, as you get further from the shore, there's fewer bat, the lower amounts of bat activity. There's a very strong relationship between bat activity and weather um, that's probably similar to that observed on land. Um, and long distance migratory species, again, are the primary species involved. So ultimately, wherever, where we get our energy has costs, environmental costs and, and society costs, no matter what the source is. And um, my opinion with, based on what we've learned from wind, wind energy is a pretty critical part of the energy future if we wanna move away from, from fossil generation. But it, you know, it, like any other source of, of energy, it's not without its impacts. Um, from an ecological perspective, long distance migratory bats like the hoary bats are, are uniquely vulnerable perhaps to wind and probably more of a concern than, the, than actually the listed rare species who, who occasionally show up at wind farms but not nearly as common. And I think it's important you know, to do what we can within the industry um, to minimize these impacts. And I, give, I do give the wind industry a lot of credit. They've been extremely invested in research to understand this problem. They've, they've prioritized bats in particular in their interactions with, with wind turbines as an area that, that demands a lot of research. And, and there's a lot going on. I think 15 years ago, if you asked a bat biologist, you know, is there gonna be a lot more research happening in, in 10 years for bats? You know, there's probably, there was a very, very small research community for bats. And right now there's an immense amount of work going on throughout North America for bats. Unfortunately, because it's inspired by factors that are threatening bats, but we are learning a lot. And I think research like this, that's, that's almost entirely conducted on behalf of the wind industry is, is paving the way for a variety of methods to, to minimize the risk from wind. 15 years ago also, I, I think there was this notion that you could find a place where there wouldn't be risk to bats. And what's been clear to me in, in my work throughout much of, of North America is that there's essentially bats everywhere. And it's more how you operate a wind farm than where you put it um, on, a, on a small scale. Certainly regionally, there are areas where there's a lot higher risk to bats. And I think there's some, some great potential down the road to kind of extend the concept of, of smart curtailment on a regional basis and focus our efforts and attention on the, the areas in which fatality rates are much higher. And those tend to be um, you know, the mid-Atlantic forested ridgelines, in some cases, the Midwest. Um, here in Maine, we're relatively, uh, I don't know if it's lucky or not, but the, the fatality rates for bats are substantially lower in, in the northern northeast than a lot of the other parts of the country. It doesn't mean that, that, that there's not an issue, but the magnitude of those risks are, are certainly lower um, in more northern places uh, for the most part. So there's not currently a, a mechanism for it, but you know, I, I think that there's potential down the road where something like smart curtailment um, could be incentivized to focus again across the industry to focus efforts on the areas of the country and in habitats where impacts are highest. But it'll take a lot of, of uh, th critical thinking and strategy in terms of how that could be done, recognizing that you know, the way our power grid works doesn't necessarily facilitate an easy solution. Um, so at this point, it's kind of being uh, methods to curtail turbines are being developed on a project by project basis, um, but it, it's, it's clear that the industry is, is paying attention to this issue and, and doing what they can to, to learn more about it. So from a practical perspective, I wanted to at least include something. If you actually wanna go see or hear a bat, what can you do? Um, luckily in Maine, we have a lot of forested habitats and pretty good places to, to see bats. You, you do really need a bat detector if you wanna hear them. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of different options out there, including something um, as small as 
uh, not even the size of a deck of cards that you can plug into an iPhone or an iPad. Um, I, I've sort of made the commitment here, just thinking about this talk, to try to get um, some form of bat detectors out to some of the libraries in the area so they could be checked out. Because um, a bat detector really does unlock a lot of, uh, of this world that's otherwise inaccessible. But around here, you know, pretty much any forested place, particularly with those with water, right around sunset in the first hour or so, just as it's getting hard to see, is when you're most likely to see bats flying around. And if you have a bat detector, you'll quickly realize that they make you hear a lot more bats than you do typically see. Um, in terms of, of things you can do to help bats, a lot of these issues, like white nose syndrome, is a very big thing. It's it's at this point, there's an immense amount of research into that single disease. There's not a lot of, of great news in terms of preventing it, but there is some good news that, that you know, some bats are surviving. And I think uh, at this point, again, as individuals, there's not a whole lot to do there other than you know, supporting the organizations like Bat Conservation International that are, that are doing a lot of, of research and, and, and funding some of these efforts to protect some of the hibernacula. Um, here in Maine, if you're you know, cutting firewood or, fire, or uh, clearing trees, you can time those activities to occur outside of the spring and early summer when, uh, they, when bats would have pups present. And really, um, another thing, obviously, organizations like Harps Whale um, Heritage Land Trust, they're preserving good habitat on the coast. You know, habitat for bats in the summer isn't, tends, doesn't tend to be limiting in Maine, but um, that's currently. So it, it's vital to maintain these places where bats can find good habitat um, throughout the state, but especially here on the coast. And I've included some, uh, this is by no means a comprehensive uh, list of, of good things to read, but there's some recent papers that are out there that all of which can be found online at this website. Kathy's, um, this is a website that has compiled an enormous amount of work that's been done, not only offshore, but in terrestrial wind. So you can find you know, lifetimes worth of reading material there. And there's some great um, online resources now to try to compile acoustic surveys results from across the country so that we can know more about where bats are, when they occur, and which species are present. And then obviously, um, I highly recommend uh, Don Griffin's book, um, Listening in the Dark. It's, it's a fascinating history, and also it gets really into the many of the, the, the interesting aspects of echolocation. And even now, the people doing cutting edge research often note that the, the fundamental core of their research questions were really contained in a lot of, of Griffin's early writings. So he was a pioneer in, in many senses for, for all bat biologists to follow. And with that, um, hopefully we have some, some questions. All right, that was really interesting. Thank you, Trevor. Um, so again, like I said at the beginning, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and I will ask them. Um, so we'll give everyone a moment to do that. Trevor, I have just a kind of a silly little question um, when I was younger, I loved tossing pebbles in the air because then the bats would swoop <laughs> down and get them. Is that actually bad for them? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't think so. I, I mean, it might waste their time a little bit, but, yeah. but no, I mean, I think people that, people that fly fish often will, will report bats, you know, able to actually track the, the flies and, and lines. Certainly, I mean, that, that's a great example of, of how maneuverable they are and, and being able to track something as fast moving as a, as a pebble. Um, it's hard pressed to find bats enough to do that anymore. Those were probably, um, those are probably little brown bats, which used to be everywhere again, kind of flying along pond edges and, and, and waterways. Um, so there's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one is, will having a bat house attract more bats to your house? So that's, uh, that's a good question. There's a lot, there's not a ton of consistent information I see on, on, what bat houses do. A lot of times people recommend them as a way to provide an alternative roost if you're excluding bats, for example. So if you have a colony of bats in your attic and you don't want them 
in your attic anymore. <laughs> and, and you, I mean, it's best again to do that work in the winter when they're likely not there. But then a lot of times people will recommend putting up a bat house at the same time so that when the, where the bats will likely come back and try to get back in. And if they have another place to go instead, they're likely to go. I don't necessarily think bat houses would attract bats. Um, they're, if they're there at your house, they're probably there because they like your house, not, not the yard, for example. So um, I, I, I don't have a lot of direct experience with bat houses, but they certainly are effective at, at um, you know, bats definitely use them. What is also true is that, you know, bats are kind of picky about where they'll go. And so having a variety of houses in a different amounts of sun and shade and so forth is, is better. Um, we've done some work recently with bats roosting in rock piles and, you know, man-made and also, you know, talus piles, like for example, in Acadia and, and bats move around a lot and they'll roost in different places, depending on what the weather's like. Um, the most important roosts are maternity roosts where, where females will have, you know, non-flying pups. And in those cases, they're more likely to, to be picky and find a roost where they can all squeeze in together. So, I mean, that would be the best thing is if you're able to actually create a maternity roost in, in one of these structures. And it, it certainly does happen. Um, but ordinarily, if you find bats, it's because they, they found just what they need in your attic. And that's the challenge is to, to you know, keep them out of there at the right time of year so you're not trapping them in the house, um, but also giving them kind of another place that they can go. Right, okay. Um, someone asked, else asked if you have a recording of bat sounds that you could play for us. I might. I, so I went out a couple nights ago with, with my iPhone bat detector. I did record a few bats. Let me see. Um, they sound, so it depends on the detector. Ultimately, it's it's the sound that it's a, it's a detector turning the sound into something that you can hear, and there's several different ways that that can be done. One is just by dividing the frequency into into smaller, you know, cutting it down so that's in the range of human hearing, and the other is for for a computer to actually record it and slow it down. So, and they sound differently depending on which detector you use. Okay, this. Oops. Wait a second. So the problem is there's crickets here too. I don't know if you can hear that. That's not a very good recording. Hang on. But it, they yeah. often sound sort of like chirps would be mm -hmm. if you've heard an osprey, they sound a little bit like that. Oh, here we go. So that's a time, ex that's a slowed down recording. Mm -hmm. And then this is another version. So they, it basically sounds like little little chirps or clicks. Um, mm -hmm. What a lot of these detectors do as well as you can see, you can see the call on the screen. So the, the ones connected to a phone are kind of nice because you can actually look at the frequency and identify, you know, while the bat is flying around. Um, you can do that with a with a traditional bat detector too but it takes a lot more training to to be able to hear what they sound like they're they're not like birds where they can be identified relatively easily by their song um, it's more just chirping and figuring out what frequency they're chirping at that that's useful for identifying them interesting um there's another question about um wind farms in the south of spain it says there are huge wind farms in the south of spain is there concern in europe as there is here for bats Yes. So um, interestingly, there, you know, there are lots of bats in Europe. There's, I don't think there's any overlap in terms of the actual species. So there's similar species. It's, it's like many birds. There, there's something analogous to a robin, but they're not the same. So I'm not as familiar with the exact species, but there certainly are um, a lot of wind farms. They've, they were developed much earlier in Europe than here. Um, the same is true for offshore. And there's definitely work being done on bats there as well. Um, Germany in particular is doing a lot of work very similar to what I've been doing with acoustics of, of putting detectors on turbines. They're very, they're, from my knowledge of their work, their results are, are really similar to what we're finding here, even though there's a different mix of species. So again, it's, it's migratory species there. There's slightly different ones, but um, there's seasonal predict, seasonally predictable patterns. Um, 
but yeah, there's there's certainly some very similar work going on there. In Spain in particular, I know they've done a lot of work with eagles as well, um, but bats are, are clearly an issue kind of wherever they occur with, with wind farms. Um, I believe and there's plenty of research on that same Tethys website um, for what's going on in Europe, but there have been some sort of international symposia where people come from kind of around the world and compare notes. Um, and many times there's a lot of similarities in, in what we're finding, um, even in different, different continents. Mm -hmm. And then there's another question, um, wondering if there's been any progress in discovering how to treat white nose disease. Um, I'm not super up on the latest research. There have been some, I don't think there have been very many successful attempts to, you know, eradicate the, the fungus. It's a fungus and it likes cold conditions. And once it's in a cave, it's pretty hard to get rid of. Um, there were some efforts actually done here in Maine where they would, they put bats with white nose into a uh, old military bunker, a concrete bunker and then tried various methods to decontaminate it and to actually you know, warm up the bunker to keep, to keep bats active. Um, I mean, it was very difficult. Um, so what white nose does is basically irritates the bats and makes them wake up and use up their energy reserves. It doesn't necessarily kill them directly, but it, it causes the bats to, to be much weakened. Um, so one thought was that if you kept them, if you fed them all winter and kept them active, uh, you could, you know, save individual bats. And that does kind of seem to be the case, but it's not really practical on a, on a large scale. Uh, there, there are bat species that aren't affected by white nose syndrome, even though they live in caves that, that have it. Interestingly, the big eared bats, which don't occur in Maine, live in caves all year in the Southeast. And to my knowledge, they don't, they're not affected by white nose. And so it's possible that it, over their evolutionary history, they've encountered it before. Um, and dealt with it. European bats also do not appear to be affected to my knowledge. So again, it was likely present in Europe long ago. Um, the, the encouraging news is that, you know, there is a, a small set of the population does survive and whether it's because they're immune to the effects or less affected, um, there does seem to be a, 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 a small number of bats that are making it through and, and populations are being sustained in these caves just at much lower levels. Um, so there are some increasing trends for some species in, in uh, the Northeast, but it's, there's not a lot of good news on the white nose front, I'm afraid at this point. Yeah. Um, I think I'll choose this one last question. Um, I think I'm actually curious to know the answer to this too, but she asks if you can explain um, why though bats can detect the turbine blades, they can't avoid them. Maybe you addressed this and I forgot. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think, well, there's a couple, there's a couple other theories that I, that I didn't mention. Um, one of which is that bats, when faced with a vertical shiny thing, like a piece of glass or a piece of metal, there's some evidence that they mistake it for water and they actually try to go up and, and you know, drink from it. And there's some interesting work that they've been doing in, in a lab setting where they can put a vertical sheet of, of, of reflective material and bats will actually go right up to it. And it's as if they either can't detect it or, or are attracted to it in whatever way. And so there was a, uh, the idea was that if you put a coating, a textured coating on turbines, you could, you could reduce that likelihood. And they've done that experiment on a larger scale, but you know, there are some issues with just attaching that material to a big turbine. So I think that work is still ongoing. But as far as the blades, I, I think it's just a matter of speed. I think you know the tips of these blades are going you know upwards of 100 miles an hour or more, and if they detect them, they're simply not able to get out of the way. I think generally, over evolutionary time, the bat was the thing that was moving, and as far as obstacles, it was you know getting around trees, getting around you know whatever other things were in its path, and it's not expecting other things to be coming at it so quickly. So the same reason that you know bats are susceptible to roadkill occasionally, I think that's kind of what's happening. It's not that the bat is colliding, flying into the blade, it's the blade is hitting the bat. And again, when, when the turbine is off, there's no evidence that, that they pose any risk at all. And so bats actually will, will go and they've been videoed, you know, roosting on turbine blades that aren't spinning just to kind of 
check them out. And it's entirely possible also that the blades are coated with, with insect remains, uh, just like your windshield does, and that that could, you know, attract. It could be an interesting smell, certainly for bats too. Um, so it it really does appear, you know, functionally it's it's a it's a factor of the turbine being on. And again, I guess that's why curtailment works. Um, the other method that I didn't address of that the industry is looking into a lot is to deter if you can deter bats by you know blasting ultrasound out from a turbine at a level that would just scare the bats all away. And there's some evidence that it might work a little bit for certain species, but it's not it's not a slam dunk kind of silver bullet approach. Um, that would be far preferable for, from the wind industry's perspective than shutting turbines down. Um, but I think there's there's a lot more opportunity to really winnow down the amount of curtailment dramatically, even by using you know, bat detectors themselves to actually trigger when the turbines are off. So, so that's where I think, you know, that's where my research is, is focusing in, is how to use that technique that we know is effective, just very unpopular and make it better and less, less wasteful ultimately in terms of, of, of the turbines being operating. Because, you know, that's the goal for everybody is to have them operate as much as possible when there's no risk and only shut down during the, the really small subset of time when bats are actually present. Great. All right. Well, again, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I thought it was really interesting. I know a lot of people, there's people who have posted in the chat that they really appreciate you giving this talk and appreciate Great. you doing this work. So well, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. And thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night.